Welcome back, everybody, to uh, the Fine Goat Farm podcast with me, Lisa Check. Today, we're going to be talking about the Natural Dye Library. But before that, here's what's happening on the farm. It is um, just the beginning of June, and um, the garden is doing really well. The weird thing is, though, with all these fires in Canada, so it has been overcast for over a week now, and I think today and tomorrow is supposed to be maybe the worst that we're going to be getting. Um, every night, the moon is red. Every day, the sun is red. It is just horrible. Um, so we're not getting a lot of sunshine, you know, it's because it's being covered by all the smoke in the air. Um, as far as animals, everybody's doing well. We have um, two goat groups here from Emily. So we have a little buck group that has, I think, five individuals. And then we have a big doe group that has, I think, about 40. All different sizes, all different shapes, all different colors. And they're all here to eat down the grass because we have too much grass and not enough animals. And of course, our sheep are doing fantastic. Um, they're loving all the nice grass. And we're hoping that it will get some rain eventually because, again, it has been um, a, one of the driest years on record. I think we've only gotten like 10 inches of rain. So whoever says that um, that climate change is not a real thing, they should come to the mid-Atlantic because we are seeing it here for sure. So let's get to it. Um, I hope that you see by now that there is so much to know about natural dyeing. And a lot of it you just cannot learn from a book, but a book is always a good place to start in whatever kind of practice that you're taking up. Um, but there are so many aspects to natural dyeing. You can be growing your own plants. You can be foraging plants. You can be buying from um, fair trade sources. You can be doing all three. And you know you need a, a space, a reference, a place to start. And so these books that I'll be talking about today are really good resources to start your library. Um, and again, I've talked about this before, natural dyeing is part science, but yes, it's a whole lot of art. And because plants and climate and all that are different, you're going to get different results based on the time of year that you are dying based on what's happening in the environment this year as opposed to last year or 10 years ago. Um, it's, it's all highly variable and that's one of the great things about it because you can just be so surprised and um, just be happy about what you get. Um, it, it's, it's harder if you are someone who uh, wants to be, um, to have total, uh, colorways that always come out the same time every single time that's not going to work very well it's going to be very difficult to do um, and if you are um, a knitter or crocheter or crafter of any kind who is wanting to make a big project um, you just have to make sure that you can um, get all of the what of the yarn or the fiber or the cloth that you need for your project that has been dyed all at the same time with the same materials um, and then you will be happy. And of course, there's going to be differences from skein to skein or piece of fabric to piece of fabric. There will always be that. Um, and you have that to a certain extent with commercial dyes as well. Um, but, you know, just going with the flow and, um, ha and reveling in the colors that you get, I think is that's the place to be with natural dyeing. I'll get off my soapbox now. So um, the first one, the first book that's up here is one that um, I've read before, but a long time ago, I'm reading it again. Um, and it's called Indigo, The Search of the Color That Seduced the World. And um, this is a really great book. It's part travelogue, part memoir. It is um, not a book that is uh, a recipe book at, by any means. Um, the author, Catherine McKinley, um, is a Fulbright scholar, and she went to West Africa to research indigo 
um, that has been traded along an ancient trade routes for a very, very long time. Um, and this book is, is great. It rounds out all the technical books and it, it will have you falling in love with some of the um, more spiritual parts of indigo and traditional and historical um, basis of indigo. Along that same line, here's a book, The Perfect Red, and that is about Cochineal. And so it's a story of and it, what the book says, empire espionage and the quest for the color of desire. Um, basically, before the new world was uh, discovered, um, the red that could be achieved in Europe was um, turkey red or made from matter. Um, and so there wasn't this vibrant, almost magenta side of red. Um, and so this book talks about um, how pirates and royals and scientists all work to unlock the color that was in this very small insect that they found in the New World. A really fun book. Here's the first book that I ever bought as a natural dyer. Um, it was published in the 90s. It's called Indigo Matter and Marigold. It's by Trudy Van Stralen. And it is, um, it's such an incredibly beautiful book. Um, I love that it does show um, the colors that you can achieve on many different bases, whether it's cloth or yarn. Um, it does give recipes. It does some with combinations of dye stuffs, like using two different dyes to get a, a third color. And what I love about it, it's beautiful, it's inspiring, it's a large book. It is out of print now, but you can find it used um, on um, online or in the used bookstores. And it's, like I said, it's a great book and um, where I started with my practice of natural dyeing. This book I depend on all the time. And so it's called Wild Color, it's by Jenny Dean. This book was originally uh, published in 1999 and is now back in print. Um, it is uh, much more technical than any of the ones I've talked about so far. And it has many, many dyes. Um, it has uh, and all plant dyes. Uh, I, don't, I don't think there's cochineal in there. Um, but um, I'd have to look at that. I'm not positive. But I don't think it does. Anyway, it talks about um, each dye stuff and the color that you can get with it. With a mordant, without a mordant, with some kind of afterbath like iron or copper, or without that. And it also shows the difference between colors for different parts of the plant. For instance, if you can get color uh, from the leaves and also from the nuts. So let's say a black walnut, you can get color from the leaves, you can col get color from the nuts. So they will have, she will have a, the array of colors that you can get from each of those parts of that tree. Um, and so that's, it's, it also talks about how to grow the plants if it's something that can be cultivated. So it's a really great all around resource. Talks about mordantine, talks about um, after bath. So um, this is a, another really good place to start if you're just wanting to start a natural dye practice because it goes through all the basics and then gives you so many plants to choose from. It's, um, it's really a great resource. This one is so fun. This is called Journeys of Natu Journeys in Natural Dying, and it's by Christine Vehar and Adrian uh, Rodriguez, and they are the people behind um, A Verb to Keep Warm, and that's a store in I think the Oakland area in the Bay Area. Um, so this totally appeals to um, my love of natural dyeing, but also like. It again, it's kind of a travelogue. It for focuses on four different countries. So the authors went to these four countries and um, died with the local dyers there and then um, brought back the information. Yes, there, there are recipes. Yes, there are, there's beautiful pictures of um, the samples that they made with all kinds of notes, with mordants, without mordants, how, how strong weight of fiber and all that kind of stuff. So they went to Japan, they went to Mexico, they went to Iceland, and they went to Indonesia. 
Um, so uh, it's, it's just really a great book. I highly recommend it. And um, the photos are so inspiring. And again, yeah, it appeals to my, you know, wanderlust and, um, and the natural dying. Here's one by Rebecca Burgess, who wrote, uh, the, who was the author of uh, Fiber Shed as well. It's called Harvesting Color, How to Find Plants and Make Natural Dyes. This book, book really focuses on native plants and invasive plants that you can forage. Um, there's, there is not a whole lot of information about um, dyes of plants that you can um, grow yourself. And a fun thing about this one is it's or organized by season so that you can not only collect locally, but, uh, but also what's in season locally. Um, and then they have really good um, s knitted up samples. Um, so you get all kinds of um, inspiration from the color, but also what you can do with the yarn once you have dyed it. There's also really good information about how to collect responsibly so that you're not um, causing an extinction event um, especially when you're talking about lichens or even some of the roadside um, plants that you may be foraging. The Dyer's Garden by Rita Buchanan. This is also kind of an old book. It's a slim book. Um, and she wrote this one and also um, the, the Weaver's Garden. They're very similar books. The Dyer's Garden, obviously, it's just about dyeing. Um, it is packed with information about how to grow dye plants. There's information in there about where to find plants and seeds, which is also really great, and how to design your plant, your uh, dye garden. Um, it, there's also really helpful information about how to use the dye plants once they're grown, what to do with the flowers, or how to set up your pots. The, the Weaver's Garden has all the information in the Dyer's Garden, but it also includes growing cotton and flax. So if you're interested in um, growing fiber as well, you might consider getting the Weaver's Garden. Now, this is a book for geeks. So this is The Art and Science of Natural Dyes. So this was is written by uh, Joy Botrop and um, Catherine Ellis. This is really a book about chemistry and the chemistry of natural dyes, how the mordants work, why they work, what the modifiers are, why they work. It talks about pH and it talks about, um, um, you know, all, all like your water quality and everything in there. Um, just how does, how do natural dyes work and what are the things that can change what's coming out from them? So it's really a great resource. Um, it talks about the range of colors you can get, but it's really, really looking scientifically. There's a companion to this book that's coming out, I believe, in July um, that is um, the recipes and more samples. So um, that one uh, will also be a good companion to this art and science of natural dyes. But really, this one is for geeks. If you're just starting out... Um, with natural dyeing, I probably would say, you know, this one save for when, for, you know, as you have more questions about the chemistry, um, choose one of the other books that, or one or two of the other books that I've um, talked about here to get started. So, of course, those are the books, but um, there's so many things beyond books. So, I wanted to talk a little bit about what we can find online. Feedback Fridays is a, sh uh, a Zoom show that's put on by Botanical Colors about every other week. They started these calls during the pandemic, and I think that originally they really were uh, a place where people could ask questions of Kathy Hattori, and that's probably where the name Feedback Friday came. Um, now it's a free wheel wheeling kind of a program. They have presentations from all kinds of artists and authors and entrepreneurs, anybody who's involved in natural dyeing um, or working with natural substances. There's a woman, um, there's, they've had a, an ink maker. They've had a woman who works with um, earth pigments. 
They have had um, a woman who works with seaweed to get color. All different, really, really interesting people. A, a, a woman in Brazil who's mapping um, the dye plants in the rainforest, or in Brazil, ho hopefully all of Brazil, but that's a big, that's a big project. Um, I love participating in these when they're live um, because they do open my eyes to um, what people are doing with dyes and earth pigments and um, but also they have all these are recorded and on the website so you can go to botanicalcolors.com and look at the feedback friday videos and you know watch one um, on a day when you feel like learning and seeing something new it's really really fun of course the natu the just peak fiber shed natural dyers journal is a page on that website and um, it has great information about dyes that are found in our local uh, fiber shed. There's information about the plant itself, um, how it grows, where it grows, um, how you can cultivate it or how you can forage it, um, the medicinal uses, the historical uses in some cases. And there is some information about dye technique, but it's primarily a place, an, an inspirational place to see what you can do with plants that are in our area to get color. And there are new, I think at so far we have put up, um, I think 10 different plants so and essays involving that. And in, in the essays, there's also pictures of the colors that we have gotten with our experimentation. And then the Botanical Colors website itself, um, is a really good place for information too, and it's and it's all free in there. So they have information about how to scour. They have information about how to mordant and what mordants to use on what. And of course, they have um, information on how to use the dye products that they specifically offer. Um, and like I said just a few seconds ago, they also have all the past fr uh, Feedback Friday recordings too. It's a really great free re resource. Um, and it's at botanicalcolors.com. And then there is the Indigo Shade Map. So this is a website that shares information about indigo and the blue bearing plants from all over the world. And it's, you can find that at indigoshademap.org. It's an interactive infographic kind of a map and it's divided up kind of by species of the indigo. So you can take your cursor and point it to um, where you live, or maybe you're interested in um, what they might use in Africa. Then you can point it, point your cursor at Africa, and you can see um, places where indigo is being planted and used today and also in history. And so, and they have um, some of the places that you um, can click on are our actual um, companies or organizations. It's a, it's a fun resource. So my dye highlight for this time is indigo. And I first want to say that there's so much to know about indigo, to learn about indigo. Um, so this is, right now, this is just a very um, small sliver of information that's out there about indigo. So th like I said before, there are several blue yielding plants. Um, Japanese indigo is one that grows well here in the mid-Atlantic and basically all over the United States. There are some varieties that just don't grow well outside of a, of a very tropical area. Um, and of course, you can go to that indigo shade map and find out more about the, the eight different blue yielding plants. Indigo was brought here to the United States with the slave trade. Um, Africans had the knowledge of how to grow the plants, when to best, best, use the, best harvest the plants to yield the most dye, and then how to get the dye out of the plant because, it, let's face it, it's a little bit difficult to get that plant to give up its blue. And then how to use the dye that's coming out to have it on fabric. So indica, indigo became a big export in the United States and a part of the horrible slave history of our nation because these people from West Africa were, at, were kidnapped, kidnapped from their con countries for their knowledge and then forced to work for those wealthy white land owners. And in fact, 
um, I believe I heard that the indigo is what really, first there was indigo and then the cotton um, trade picked up and cotton planting picked up because now we had a way to dye the cotton. Indigo is a very complex dye. It has to go through several phases in order to become soluble in water and therefore available to dye. But it's also a magical dye. The vat is very much like a living being. It has to be kept warm. You need to feed it with material that will reduce indigo. It has to be pH adjusted in order to get the best color. So you really have to pay attention to the vat and treat it like um, a living entity. Um, and the magic part is that the cloth, and so you put in a white cloth or maybe a, you know, an ecru cloth or something like that. You put it into the vat. Uh, you put it under the, um, you know, under the, the level of the dye water that's in there. And when it comes out, it's a yellowy green color. And right before your eyes, as oxygen reaches the fabric, it turns blue. It's just, it is, it's so magical. When it, ha the first time you ever see it, everybody goes, oh, because they can't believe it. In order to get deeper colors, the fabric can be dipped again and again um, and overlaid so you can get a richer, deeper color. The plants are really easy to grow. They love full sun, but they do need to have rich, fertile soil and plenty of water. They grow a lot like basil, um, so any place that you would have basil would be a good place to put in indigo. And there, it's a plant that can be harvested throughout the season because basically what you're going to do is you let it grow to about maybe 10 or 12 inches and then you cut off the first six or eight inches from the tip of the plant. You're going to strip those leaves off. That's what you're going to use. And then you can take the stalks and reroot them just in water. Um, and then it's like it, they reroot themselves in just a few days. It's just like really quick. And you can then take those plant starts and replant them. So, you know, then you have more plants. You know, it can keep going as long as the uh, climate is right for, for their optimal growing. So that is a is really a renewable resource until you get outside of the comfort zone that they need for um, for growing um, here. You know they're not gonna they're not gonna do well in frost. They the seeds will overwinter in a lot of places. I know that many people um, a little south of me are uh, let their uh, indigo go to seed and it re reseeds itself. We were not so lucky as to have it recede up here, but it also could have been a weird year. Um, I should also say um, that it's a deep feeder. It needs to have um, a lot of fertilizer. Um, last year, we weren't very successful growing it um, in outside, but Bill has this hydroponic system. And so we put, we put it in the hydroponic system, which gets nutrients uh, solution on it all the time and man they grow they grew really really well I had a very great crop um, and I should also say that there are two ways that you can use um, your indigo so you can make a vat where you're going to get the the indigo that we're used to the very um, dark blue almost navy kind of colors starting at royal going to navy um, or you can use the fresh leaves, which is what I did with my plants. Um, and you can get um, a, a beautiful kind of oceany turquoise color um, from using fresh leaf. And there's information out there up, um, on how to do that. So my farm yarn highlight of the day is our Rambouillet Bulky. This is a relatively new yarn for, for me. Um, it's a two-ply bulky yarn. It's made from Rambouillet fleeces grown on a partner farm in Pennsylvania. In Pennsylvania. Rambouillet is like a merino. It's a, a fine wool sheep, um, very fine, very crimpy. This yarn has great st stitch definition, and it's wonderful for sweaters, hats, cows, scarves, 
things to keep you warm in the winter. Um, I'm, I'm currently um, knitting a sweater with it and I just um, am, I'm gonna love this sweater when it's done. Each skein is about 100 yards in a four ounce portion. And it is just a beautiful, beautiful yarn. So um, if you're local, stop by and come in and, and see it, or maybe uh, you will come to uh, Rhinebeck or um, Shenandoah Valley Fiber Festival or Maryland Sheep and Wool, and you can see it there. So until next time, happy making.